welcome to Films and Stuff with your hosts, Pete Mitchell and Ethan Hunt. All right, Ethan. Pete, welcome back. We've got another week, another great episode ahead of us. Last week, we said we were super excited for our episode. And I think this week, we can say we're probably even more excited for this episode, right? Oh my God, I, my, I, I've been itching to talk about this with someone for seven weeks. Seven weeks? Because there were seven episodes. Yeah, and after every right. episode, I wanted to talk to someone about it. But it wasn't until now that, you know, and, and yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something unprecedented for us. Spoiler alert. <laughs> at the beginning, at the beginning. You know, even you and I have exercised a lot of restraint by not discussing it with each other. Because I think we knew as soon as we opened up the topic, it would be Pandora's box. We would never be able to to control ourselves, stop, or, you know, like not not give each other spoilers, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And 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 you know, things that we want to talk about will eventually go from a 10 minute conversation about an episode recap into a two hour thesis on where star wars is going so without further so without further ado we should probably discuss what we're going to discuss or mention what we're going to discuss which is the book of boba fett book of boba fett that's right uh the latest maybe not the greatest but the latest show in the disney star wars tv series yes uh that john favreau did it as well just like he did for mandalorian yeah, I'm not sure if he directed. Actually, that's on me. I should have checked that out. But I'm not sure how many he's directed or written or if he's not been a director or a writer, but just an overarching producer a la Kevin Feige and the Marvel Universe. Um, so he is, he is definitely credited as the creator. Uh, right. But every, every episode has a different director and he is not listed as any of those directors. Yeah, which doesn't surprise me, which doesn't surprise me. I think Favs, uh, I I give him all the credit in the world uh, and, you know, brass aside. So we're not talking about Kevin Feige. We're not talking about Kathleen Kennedy. We're not talking about the Disney brass, right? Mm -hmm. We're talking about the guys with the boots on the ground. I think if you look at Favs, he's the guy that really on the ground built up the marvel cinematic universe or at least ignited it let's not say built up i I think that's maybe giving him too much credit where it's maybe not necessarily due Mm -hmm. uh but he certainly ignited it he certainly kick-started it and uh and in terms of the star wars universe i think him and filoni dave filoni who i've known of since the clone wars tv show have really righted the ship for Star Wars as a franchise. I don't want to say saved it, but at the same time, I think they've certainly prevented it from taking on more water, if you want to take that. It was was going off course. It was going off course. We weren't really sure where it was headed, and they kind of steered it back into a place that we're more comfortable with, right? I agree. I agree. I think philosophically, if you're going to look at it at that level, I think... Uh, you know, between Favs, between Filoni, uh, to a lesser extent, I guess even, I think it's Rodriguez, who's the, one of the directors. Yeah. Robert Rodriguez, uh, Robert directed Rodriguez. Three, three episodes. Filoni did one, Steph Green won, Bryce Dallas Howard did one. Well, yeah, so she's, anyway, she's killing it as it is. Great actor, great director, very yeah. good eye. I think mm. she's done a couple of Mandalorian episodes as well. Uh, so any in anyway, let, before we before we jump into Book of Boba uh, Fett, my hats off to the three of them, the four of them. That team has really pulled it off. There, they've always yeah. been excellent writers, mm-hmm. but really, I never thought until they were a part of the Disney universe, which is to say MCU and Star Wars, mm-hmm. I didn't see them as your typical franchise writers and now that's all i can see them as that's not to say that he's not i mean fabs has done some wonderful work uh swingers and then of course uh also uh elf he's done a bunch of these kinds of shows uh chef also very good 
I thought, uh, you know, so yeah. again, hats off to them. I think as a fan of the Star Wars universe, as a fan of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, as a fan of the comics, as a fan of the lore, I give them full credit, uh, you know, and when things were looking really dour and really bad for the franchise, <laughs> I think they've, yeah. they've really uh, salvaged what they could with it. So we can't, you can't really talk about Book of Boba Fett without talking about The Mandalorian. But these two series, do you think that they've had it easier or more difficult because they're kind of adjacent to the, you know, the main Star Wars story or the, the, the cinematic stories that everyone's kind of grown up with? Do you think that makes their job easier or more difficult? So I think when it comes to the Mandalorian, uh, and by the Mandalorian, I mean the story of Mandalore and the Mandalorians in general. So that means, you know, mm. uh, uh, Bo-Katan, uh, uh, Boba Fett, slash yeah. Jango Fett, and Jin, uh, Din Djarin, all of these guys. I think what it does is it's not easy or hard because even though they're obviously ancillarily connected to the Star Wars universe. Uh, sorry, the Skywalker universe. Let's put it that way, right? Oh, that's the a good Skywalker way to put it. saga. Did you right? just make that up? All right, uh, deserved. Yeah. That's nice. Uh, well, I've always saw. I heard. I think I might have heard it somewhere that the idea was that you know, mm. in the Star Wars universe, we know the Star Wars universe is the extended universe, but really, yeah. we've only ever focused on the Skywalker saga, right? right. Whether it's Anakin in the prequels to yeah. Luke in the original trilogy to to whatever you want to call it in the sequel trilogy, right? Because yeah. I, I, they're not really Skywalker. I, anyway, mm. that's a discussion. Yeah. That's a controversial discussion. I don't want to really get into that. Indeed. Um, but with, the, with these ancillary con- characters, the, way, the reason I think it works really well is because even, they're connected lightly to the Skywalker saga or to the Skywalker universe, yeah. But because we don't really know much about them outside of that context, mm-hmm. that gives the writers and the creators a lot of flexibility to write and do whatever they want creatively. I agree. I, I think I think that's probably one of the, I mean, I don't think there's any other way to sugarcoat it, which is when you see a, you know, a Star Wars movie after Return of the Jedi, right? You know, what is, you know, seven, eight, nine. Everyone has some idea in their mind about what that should look like, what the characters should be, right? And that's just kind exactly. of natural human nature. You, you've already got a point of reference. Whereas when you're talking about Mandalorian, when you're talking about Boba Fett, you have maybe a little, at least in the sense of Boba Fett, you know what his armor looks like and you know something that he's kind of a quiet guy and an assassin. But you don't really have any point of reference in terms of, you know, what his backstory is, you know, what his motivations are, anything apart from, you know, the the original one, two, three, right? Where you saw the, uh, you know, him and his father, Jenga. So yeah. I think that gives them, like you said, a little bit more flexibility to create their world. And we're probably a little bit more open to accepting that world just because we don't have any other frame of reference or expectation for what it should be. Yeah, and I think what they've done really well is, so if you look, there there are three kinds of people who watch the, these movies, right? Or these, these shows. There's the, let's call them the quote-unquote, the, the normals, right? Which is to say they've only ever seen the movies, right? Or mm-hmm. they're not really fans, but they like sci-fi, so they're into it. Mm-hmm. Then you have, uh, sorry, so... Let's put it this way. So the normals are the guys who have seen the movies and they know Star Wars in general as a concept. And that's it. Then you have, let's say, the hardcores who have seen the movies, who have seen the shows, which is to say Clone Wars, Rebels, all these other animated shows. They've re- Maybe they've read some of the extended universe books or novels, which are now some of them are considered canon. Some are not. And then you have the third kind of people who have not seen anything and don't care for Star Wars, right? And that's fine. So I think what these guys have done, uh, Favs and Filoni, is very gently and with great respect, they've taken uh, the story of 
Django Fett slash Boba Fett slash the clones. They've taken the story of Din Djarin as, uh, as we know, the Mandalorian and Bo-Katan. And they've said, look, this is their story. We're going to present it to you. But we're also going to fit that very nicely with the existing lore. Right. So, for example, I haven't seen all of the Clone Wars animated shows. I have seen the Rebels animated show. So I understand where Bo-Katan's story is. I understand a little bit of where uh, the, the story of the Mandalorians as a race and as a planet, planet is. And what they've said is, okay, well, let's look at Jango Fett. Let's look at Boba Fett. How do we fit his story into that world so that it's still ancillary to the existing shows that everyone has seen or the existing movies that everyone has seen, but still different. And so we don't want to trash anything that exists. We actually want to make it fit around that. And I think that they've done masterfully. Mm -hmm. Right. So for those people who have seen all the shows, you get a very nice throwback. You get to understand, ah, this is why the Darksaber is so important for the Mandalorians. This is why... Um, you know, Grogu is or isn't important. You get you get a lot of these callbacks that your average fan probably doesn't know, but still doesn't care because it's still a good show. Yeah, I think that's I think you're right, and that's also a very delicate balance. There's a balance between kind of the pandering and yeah. you know probably yeah. putting in the the things that everyone kind of wants or expects to see, and at the same time, like you said, you know, Bo Katan who's, um, you know, a character that I heard the name of, but even I'm a little bit fuzzy on, you know, who she was and I needed to kind of like refresh my reference. You know, my my younger sister, who's actually watched The Mandalorian, uh, you know, start to finish, got really into Boba Fett, doesn't know anything about Bo-Katan, but right. at least the character was introduced in a subtle enough way that you can just kind of accept her appearance and it doesn't yeah. distort the storyline. But at the same time, it doesn't leave all these like lingering unanswered questions about like, who is this? I don't understand how they just kind of like jumped into the show and, and where they fit into things, you know? So I think, I think they deserve a lot of credit just for the smooth way that they've incorporated these elements that someone like you, you know, as a, a very educated Star Wars fan can appreciate someone like me kind of accepts and someone who doesn't have any backstory, you know, is, is okay with, and it doesn't disrupt their, their viewing of this. Right. Yeah. So I think, so maybe what we should do is yeah. let's take a step back. Let's, let's give a very brief recap of the season of book of Boba Fett and maybe, and, and also where it ties in with the Mandalorian. And I think yeah. it's crucial to explain that because as we can see, especially towards the latter half of the mm -hmm. series, we understand now that what what I think John Favreau and Filoni are doing is they're building their own connected Star Wars universe, similar to what's happened with the Marvel Cinematic Universe, right? Yeah. Which is to say, of course, it's a it's a uh, uh, a Star Wars universe. Everyone's in the same mm -hmm. story. We get that, but now we're getting to a point where people characters from different shows are coming on. Yeah. Uh, to other people's shows. So, you know, you see that kind of mixing and uh, cameos taking place. And so everyone's story is getting jumbled and we'll touch back. We'll come back to this mm -hmm. point because I have some theories as to where season three of Mandalorian. I love be. hearing your theories. I love uh, hearing and, your and theories. In general. So. All right. So, let, All right, let's, so let's just, let's, let's put the, the marker down. I'll let yeah. you summarize the series, but let me put the marker down in terms of where this picks up, which is, for anyone who watched the original Return of the Jedi with all the characters that we know and love, Luke Skywalker, Han Solo, Lando, Lando. Princess Leia, yeah. the Mandalorian, uh, sorry, uh, Boba Fett, who is a Mandalorian, was thrown off one of the hover spacecrafts into a pit of a, what is it called? A Sarlacc? Yeah, that's right. The Sarlacc pit. It's thrown off into a Sarlacc pit where the Sarlacc swallows him. And then Return of the Jedi continues on for another hour and 45 minutes. And that is where we all believe Boba Fett died. 
Now, yeah. with the book of Boba Fett, which is a series centered around him, we see how he escaped from the Sarlacc, and it takes us on his journey. Yeah. So I think what... So, so let's split the series into two halves, okay? So you have, uh, let's say, episodes one through like three to four, which is really focused tightly on Boba Fett. Mm-hmm. And then five, six, seven, or four... Four, five, six, seven, or so. The latter half of the series mm-hmm. isn't focused exclusively on Boba Fett, but about his overall arc, yeah. right? So, uh, as you rightly pointed out, what we in this universe think it happens is that Boba Fett is dead. He's lying in the Sarlacc pit. Cut to episode one. You find out that. He's like Uh, in the stomach, to the extent that the Sarlacc has a stomach. He's like in the stomach, right? That's right. That's absolutely right. And you can see that his armor is damaged by the acids or whatever, and he's hanging out in there. And the whole point is that the idea is that Boba Fett has been alive this entire time. Mm -hmm. And he manages to, you know, use his uh, wits and his skills to finally escape the Sarlacc pit. And his flamethrower. His flamethrower. That's right. <laughs> yeah. His flamethrower. Basically, whatever he's got on hand with him, he's yeah. able to use to get out of the Sarlacc mm-hmm. pit. Mm-hmm. What we don't know, and what we're not, and I'm still a little fuzzy on, but I think I have the right idea, is the timeline. Mm-hmm. So a lot of Boba Fett's first half of the season is done in the current time and flashbacks. Yeah. So we see a lot of flashbacks. And of course, in the flashbacks, we see he's mm-hmm. escaped from the uh, from the Sarlacc pit. He's captured by the Tuscans, mm-hmm. uh, the Tuscan Raiders. And yes. they are, uh, they keep him captured, right? Mm-hmm. So they've, they've basically captured him as a slave. And, you know, they have him doing menial tasks and things like that. And while he's captured by the Tuscans, he works his way out of let's say uh like servitude servitude yeah. but not really servitude you know what i mean like he's he's considered uh uh well, uh, well he was a, he was like, a he was a prisoner as i recall right. from one of those early episodes he was a prisoner and then they had like this big woolly beast kind of attack their campsite and he kind of uh you know like got out of his shackles and he helped then his captors to to kill this woolly beast and then they're kind of like all right well you helped us like we'll just kind of like make you one of our own exactly that's exactly right so he goes he transitions from being prisoner to being a part of the tribe yeah and then and over the three four episodes of the first half of the season in flashbacks we see that transition Mm -hmm. happening right yeah where he goes through a period of training to live Mm -hmm. in the sun to you know where he's not got his weapons that he's traditionally mm-hmm. had. So they teach him how to use their traditional weapon, which is like yeah. this long staff with a rounded pointy end that looks like a small satellite dish. At one, looks on like an end. acorn. I just thought it was like an acorn. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. But it looks whatever it is, but it's, it's definitely not a jetpack. It's yeah. not a blaster. No. It's not a flamethrower. Yeah. So he has to, it's a very medieval, through. it's a very medieval weapon, right? Something right. like a lacrosse stick. With like an acorn head on it that yeah, can, you know, can be used so it's for like a lot a, of stabbing and stuff. It's very much a, a period of training for him, right? Mm-hmm. So, and, and it's not just training in how to wield the weapon, but it's also training on how to, and maybe this is me reading too much into it, but like how to become a better person. Yeah. Almost, right? Like, There's also you're, a lot of like desert this... survival, right? Because he's, right. as you mentioned, he's he's traditionally been a a bounty hunter you know, with uh, a spacecraft who's been flying around the universe. Now he's kind of like a sand person, right? Mm-hmm. Almost like a Jawa, right? Who's who's kind of, you know, they show like one scene where he's got to dig in the sand and they show like these big kind of fruits that, you know, have water and that's how they get their, you know, hydration. So you're right. It's It's been a very, almost like a retreat for him where he's learning like a totally different culture, a different way of fighting and a different way of kind of, survival in that in that climate in those circumstances right and i think what it also happens which is maybe something and again i'm probably reading too much into this but he goes from being someone who's been a loner mm. right 
since his father's death in episode, I think two or three, yeah. uh, I can't remember. Yeah. He's more or less now on, he's been on his own for the last 30, 40 years of his life. Mm-hmm. And now he's become a valued member and an important member of a tribe, right? So he becomes a part of a community. And by a community, I mean not like a community or, or someone who's part of like a bounty hunter's guild, but like an actual community. They look out for each other. They take care mm-hmm. of each other. They survive together in the harshest mm-hmm. of, uh, of climates, right? And so we find out, so that's most of his backstory mm-hmm. uh, or most of the flashbacks are about that. Yeah. And it's intermingled with the current storyline, but we'll get to the current storyline. Mm-hmm. And in the backstory of, or in the flashback sequences, you also see in the background how this is connected to season two of The Mandalorian uh, when you see, or sorry, season one of The Mandalorian, when you see, it, you know, he sees the flash in the sky and then he goes and saves Fennec Shand. And then I rewatched the season, uh, of all both seasons of Mandalorian, and I remember seeing that was the sequence when The Mandalorian is hunting for Fennec Shand as a bounty mm-hmm. And yeah. he uses that uh, flash generator, yeah. you know, it looks like her. a flare yeah. to blind her from getting sniped. And you yeah. see that in the background of, the, of yeah. Boba Fett. And, you know, so this is how they're interconnected. So let, let, me ask you a, Pete, let me ask you a question here, though. Yeah. When I watched Mandalorian and Fennec Shand was introduced, she had a very maybe one or two episode role. Then she reappears now in Book of Boba Fett. Was Fennec Shand a big uh, or an important character in the books or in any of the other animated series? Or is this her real first introduction to the to the franchise? So she, I remember seeing, so there was a third show in, but that's of the recent era called The Bad Batch, which is mm-hmm. about the clones, right? Yeah. And it's about the squads of clones. And she shows up in that uh, cartoon series. But that's that new. was... yeah. But that's new and that's post season one of the yeah. Mandalorian. So she yeah. wasn't a new character then. I don't. So I haven't read all the extended universe books. I don't know all those stories very yeah. well. I don't know if she's an altogether brand new character or yeah. if she's someone they brought back from the uh, the the novels and the comics. I I can't say for sure. Okay. I like her character though. I mean, she's really uh, an important character in this, right? Wonderful, wonderful, mm-hmm. wonderful. I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll get we'll touch back on this so anyway yeah. so so Fennec Shand is saved he saves her he gets her to the this like modder slash doctor slash you know back alley uh black market guy who's able to save her uh and she's like I guess like, so it should become bionic her. yeah that's what I was going to ask it what I understood from that was that she was a human she was badly injured, you know, when she got shot by that other bounty hunter that we saw in Mandalorian. Um, Boba found her, takes her to, you know, a guy who's kind of like a, let's say, modern day tattoo artist or back alley doctor, right? Mm-hmm. And she, she eventually becomes like partly cyborg, right? Like she has some yeah, parts that, in her now? Yeah, that's what I assume as well. I don't okay. I don't think they ever showed her as being a cyborg yeah. or partly robotic or mechanical before. Yeah, okay. So we're aligned on that. Yeah, so then, uh, so they create an, infor- they have an informal alliance because he mm-hmm. saved her. Mm-hmm. She helps him recover his ship, mm-hmm. uh, the, the iconic Boba Fett ship. Is there a name uh, of that ship? It's called Slave One, but I believe Disney Slave One. is. Yeah, I think that was the name of the ship, and I think they're changing that in the Disney canon because they don't want for the obvious reasons of slavery. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, but yeah. we should we should also point out that the ship was at the palace of Jabba the Hutt, which is where yes. a lot of the you know Return of the Jedi film took place. That's right. That's right. And at this point. Uh, we, which we find out at the end of season two of mm-hmm. uh, uh, the Mandalorian, is mm-hmm. that Bib Fortuna is running the show, right? And yeah. we saw Bib Fortuna, who was yeah. Jabba's right hand man slash yeah. consigliere mm-hmm. in the movies. Yeah. Uh, and you know he's he's become the major domo of the, or the leader rather of the of 
whatever. Which makes sense, right? I mean, Jabba the Hutt died, of course, in Return of the Jedi. Someone needs to take over that territory. It would make sense. It would be his, you know, right hand. I'm surprised because he was always, he seemed like a cowardly guy. So, I mean, I'm surprised he did that. But in any way, in any case, so he takes the, he gets his ship back. Oh, and Mm -hmm. we also learn, sorry, I forget to say, I forgot to say this. We also find out that his clan was murdered. Right, so the, yeah. the Tuscans were all killed, mm-hmm. uh, and they were all killed by a biker gang, allegedly. Allegedly, so they and so he gets his ship back with Fennec. Mm-hmm. He goes after the bikers, destroys them all, and everyone's happy. Or and that's where I believe we're caught up with the. Yeah. Uh, that's kind of the first. There's half. no more that's flashbacks. Kind of the, yeah, that's, that's kind right. of the first half of the series. Yeah, so there's no more flashbacks. And we're caught up to the current times mm-hmm. uh, and, uh, of this series, and now we're talking. Now we're looking at Boba Fett and his attempt to kind of regain his footing on Tatooine. Well, right? he's. So, I mean, Boba Fett is really kind of like going through. You could say like he's going through a career change, right? Where he's been yes. a bounty hunter for a long time, and obviously being. I mean, he's. He's. I'm sure had his share of battles over the years. But being thrown into the Sarlacc pit has, and then maybe this uh, rebirth that he had, you know, with the, the Sam people has kind of changed his outlook and said, hey, I'm kind of tired of being an independent contractor working for people. I want to be a ruler. Jabba is dead. I'm going to take over Jabba's territory. Yeah. So you see that transition, right? And I think mm-hmm. that's, this is what I meant by saying that, you know, I think he gets a little bit of perspective with his time in the pit and with yeah. the Chuskins is that he's like, look, I, I need to build something more for a legacy, right? And I don't want to just be a, a bounty hunter. Career change. And yeah. so he goes from being just a bounty hunter and being one of the most feared bounty hunters in the universe to transitioning towards being a crime boss, right? Mm-hmm. And he takes over Jabba's operations and then we find out that uh, he, he's struggling with that a little bit because the the Boba Fett that we know or from the movies has always we've never seen it on screen until we saw a little bit of it in the mandalorian but has always been like a really fierce and highly uh repu- uh, highly reputable character in the sense that everyone was afraid of him if boba yeah. fett showed up at your doors you were probably going to be killed or taken away i mean he was he was always kind of known also for being for like his his efficiency, right? He right. was a man of exactly. very few words, if any words, and he just kind of went in as a bounty hunter does, got the job done, moved on, took payment, and and as you mentioned, kind of he's realizing that being a ruler is a different skill set. Yeah, right. And so, and, and a lot of life lessons, a, a lot of life that... lessons, a lot of life <laughs> lessons. <in this>, really. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, and so I think we see that struggle of him really come to terms with that right where he's gone from being the guy who shoots first ask questions later to being the guy who's asking questions first who's negotiating who's taking audience and making sure that he gets the respect that he deserves but i think the problem was that he was getting respect before because he was a killer right he was a stone cone cold killer and now people are not so sure if that's the case because you know he's letting people go and he's trying to set a better example, right? So, but so that, Pete, let me ask you something. If if we stop here, yeah. we're four episodes in. Let's just say yeah. that it was a, it was a mini series, right? Let's mm-hmm. just say that was a, that was season one. What would be your impression of the show? I would have hated it. Yeah, I, I think I hate is uh, hate, hates a strong word for me, but I would say it was not at all compelling. He didn't, he didn't, there was no real interesting action scenes. Uh, We didn't really learn anything new and it was a little bit slow and to be honest, his his, his personality just wasn't compelling. It was, it was too granular in terms of kind of the the day-to-day monotony, right? I mean, it was interesting looking at him, you know, with the same people, but there was not a lot there, I think, right? And especially, especially after we saw him in season two of The yeah. Mandalorian kick total ass in that one sequence, yeah. right? When he grabs his armor and he go, he goes to absolute town on those stormtroopers. Yeah. And one of the things I must say that 
the current crop of Star Wars movies and shows have done is really give everyone their hero moments and give them context. Like, if you think about it, right? In episodes 4, 5, and 6, the original trilogy, everyone knows that Darth Vader is a badass and he is not someone to mess with. And he's got this reputation of being the most deadly Sith ever, right? He's the most powerful Force user, blah, blah, blah. But we never really see any of that, right? We don't see any of that. So we only believe that to be true because every character in the story is scared of him and confirms that until Rogue One. And then in Rogue One, we see... Darth Vader spark up his lightsaber and go to town on those rebels in that one hallway scene. And that 30 second clip gave him his hero moment where all of a sudden everyone gets goes, holy crap. Is that the, is is that the Darth- scene where he entered Princess Leia's escape craft? Yes. So that, at that, the very that, end of the movie. Yes. So that should have been, you're right, because this was teased in the original episode four, right? This is at the very beginning, but it's it's teased and it's such an early movie that I think no one's able to appreciate that. No reputation is built because of yes. that, right? And, right. and and it's too early. And don't mm-hmm. forget, this was also filmed in the 80s. It's got a lumbering David Prowse. This is well back before they had <laughs> proper, you know, fight training and sequences. Yeah. I mean, if you look now at the yeah. the... Jedi, uh, sorry, at the lightsaber battle between uh, and between Darth Vader yeah. and Obi Wan. I mean, yeah. it's like two old men with like you know colored sticks jabbing at each other. It's it's terrible. It's terrible, right? I'm not saying it's. I'm not laying fault, but I mean that's just what it is, right? I'm looking at it as objectively as possible. And Rogue One, all of a sudden, you're just like, holy crap, this guy is a killer. And everyone's scared because you get to see him use the force. You get to see him choke people. It's unbelievable. And in Mandalorian season two, Luke gets his power moment, right? Mm -hmm. Because again, between episodes five and six, Luke becomes this great Jedi master. And at the beginning of episode six, uh, Return of the Jedi, you see him, you you see him do some backflips off of that um, skiff above the Sarlacc pit. Fine. But you don't really see him kick ass, right? It's, it's again, a product of its time, filmed in the 80s. It's a little bit lumbering. Fine. But you know, you hear that he's supposed to be killer. He's supposed to be amazing. He's supposed to be one of the best uh, Jedis or the, of the current crop. We don't get to see any of that again until episode two of The Mandalorian when he destroys all the dark troopers. Right. And you, what I really like is that these shows give you an opportunity to really understand the value proposition that these characters have. Right. And that the reputation that these guys have is fairly earned. Luke is a kick ass Jedi. Here's what let us prove it to you. He's going to take on a platoon of dark troopers and kill everyone. You know, Darth Vader is a badass. All right. Let us prove it to you. He's going to take out. Okay, I mean, they're all, you know, just shooting uh, phasers at him. Fine, it's nothing, they're nothing special or powerful. But still, you get to see that he is a really vicious and efficient killer. And that's what they did with that one scene in, uh, and uh, at uh, Mandalorian Season 2 for Boba Fett. Is again, we always heard Boba Fett was a killer. We always heard that he was a really badass uh, bounty hunter. But we never get to see him really fight until that one episode in uh, Mandalorian when he gets his armor back and when he absolutely decimates all the stormtroopers and at a little bit towards the end of episode 7 of his own series in Book of Boba Fett when he and Din Djarin get to uh, you know take out a bunch of the pikes so were you, so should we summarize the, the second part of Boba Fett or should we jump right to the end and, and give our thoughts? All right. Well, there isn't much of a summary. The summary is that uh, Boba Fett is now under a uh, siege. Uh, Pike Syndicate, which are basically a drug cartel, are trying to take over Tatooine. 
He's opposed to that. He wants to maintain his power hold and not acquiesce it to anyone else. He makes an informal alliance with the other crime bosses that they'll stay neutral. They obviously uh, lie to him. The Pikes come in and they're trying to take out Boba Fett because he's the only thing standing between them and controlling the spice trade, or the drug trade of uh, on Tatooine. So, let, and let so me it culminates a, in a battle. Let me ask a clarifying question just to kind of put this in perspective. We talk about the Pike Syndicate. So is your understanding that following, you know, if we're looking at the, the films, following, you know, the death of Darth Vader, following the destruction of the Death Star again, that there's this void in the universe, the Empire is no longer controlling everything, so these other kind of little crime lords and gangs have kind of cropped up. And the Pike Syndicate is one of these such gangs that's got their own like little drug trade going. And they've got like now a lot of influence in this area. Is that kind of how the power vacuum is filled? I, I think the so the Empire, I think during the time of the Empire uh, and even during the time of the rebels, uh, you know, I think that they've always had these kinds of gangs. Mm. Right. So it just. Tatooine is was always considered a quote unquote uh, lawless place, right? Yeah. Uh, so there had always been the CD element of the underworld. Yeah. So I think that they, I don't think it was necessarily a power vacuum that yeah. the Pikes were there. I think the Pikes are just uh, a drug syndicate that's maybe always existed and are mm-hmm. trying to just expand their territories. That's all. Yeah. So this is this is called the Book of Boba Fett, but in the second half. Mandalorian makes not just a cameo, but he's almost the main character and almost the more compelling character because there's kind of like three storylines that he's involved in. The first yeah. is, you know, he he goes back to uh, I guess this other like metal smith, uh, Beskar steel smith, you know, Mandalorian. Oh, the armor, you know, yeah, yeah, uh, you know, with the the dark saber. Then he, you know, goes to Boba Fett and pledges his, you know, loyalty in helping him fight off the crime syndicate. And then, of course, possibly most interestingly, uh, he's reunited with uh, Grogu, right? And and they yeah. have this kind of like side story. So do you, do you think that Boba has kind of run its course? or And do you think that if you were Boba, you'd be a little bit frustrated that the Mandalorian was so prominent in here? Or do you think this is a byproduct of the Mandalorian just being so universally beloved and having a more unique story that that it just required him to get involved to kind of like save a series that was a little bit slow at the beginning. So I think, the, okay, so let's, let's, this is, I think, where we're going to broach into our theories of yes. as to where the show is going. I've been and waiting for this. I think the two things. One, I think pr- pulling in the Mandalorian helps with the viewership because he's a beloved character. We've seen yeah. more of him. There's yeah. more of an emotional arc to him. Yeah. He's not just some badass bounty mm-hmm. hunter with no heart. You know, he's got yeah. Grogu who's now has become his adopted son, more or less. Yeah. So that's always good. And Grogu, yeah. of course, everyone wants to see Baby Yoda. Who doesn't want to see Baby Yoda? Yeah. Right? And so I think that what they've done is two things. By introducing that those two episodes where you see him uh, before he helps on Tatooine, where you see him learn more about the dark saber and then also try to go to Grogu and try to reunite. Yeah. I think what you do is they did that now because they didn't want to do that in the first two episodes of Mandalorian season three. Yeah. Because if you do that as a part of Mandalorian season three, it kind of negates the need for Grogu being taken away from Luke Skywalker, uh, by Luke Skywalker at the yeah. end of season two, right? Mm-hmm. Because that third half of, you know, that latter third of Mandalorian season two kind of becomes superfluous and unnecessary yeah. and him going to train at all if he's just going to come back on the first episode or the second episode of season two, uh, mm-hmm. season three of Mandalorian, right? Also... In terms of, so that's what I think. So second thing is that I think what they're doing is they're really building up to the idea of where Boba Fett is going to be going forward. And here's my hot take. 
I think this show is Disney grooming the audience for a showdown, or not necessarily a showdown, but for Boba Fett becoming the savior and slash ruler of Mandalore. Not Man- not Mandalorian. Not Din Djarin. I think they're going to make it in such a way that in the upcoming seasons, we're going to see Boba Fett, who's gone through this now seven-episode arc of transitioning from bounty cold, cold-hearted bounty hunter to leader, right? To saying, okay, well, now that we've groomed you and taught you how to be a leader, now that you've done, uh, done that, we're going to put you in a position where you can make a play to become the leader of the Mandalorian planet. Does Mandalore exist anymore? So they talked about so, like the mines have been destroyed. Well, yeah. So Mandalore is supposed to be a planet that was it's invaded. All the Mandalorians, except for a few, were wiped out. Yeah. But the planet still exists. Is that correct? Yeah, I think the planet still exists. And, and it has I any think- inhabitants? Uh, that's to be determined, and yeah. that's where I think Mandalorian se- season three is going to be. I think the season three about the Mandalorian is going to be about Din Jaring trying to get redemption on Mandalore because that's what the armorer said: is yeah. you have to cleanse yourself yeah. on Mandalore uh, because you remember he could yeah. because he took off his helmet. Yeah, right. I and think admitted gonna, it. And admitted, and admitted it. it because you know he's a man of honor. Of course he would. Yeah. So I think what's going to happen is he's going to go to Mandalore. There's going to be there's going to be some play of this uh, this planet isn't inhospitable. It's not dead. Let's go back. Let's reclaim it. Let's forge a new Mandalore. Right? As a society, as a people, as a planet, mm-hmm. right? So that every Mandalorian can come back home. And I think what's going to happen is we're going to see a power play between the Mandalorian, Bo-Katan, and then Boba Fett. And I think what's going to... Because Mandalorian has no interest in being the leader. Yeah. And so far, he has shown more aptitude in the shows for being a bounty hunter than anything else, right? A little bit of him being a dad, a little bit of him being a bounty hunter, but that's it. He had no desire to be the leader. He doesn't want to have the dark saber. He get, he was ready to give it back up to Bo-Katan. But then we also get a little bit of backstory about Bo-Katan. We learned that she it's because of her that theoretically Mandalore fell. Uh, we you know so I think what's going to happen is there's going to be a play potentially between Bo-Katan and Boba Fett to come back to the Mandal uh, to the planet rebuild society and one of them is going to become the leader and i think this whole season has been about disney telling us we're grooming boba fett to really become the leader can can i just put a hot take out there yeah for a, a little bit of a devil's advocate hot take because i i really enjoyed mandalorian and i really enjoyed book of boba fett But would it be incorrect for someone to say that they have kind of messed up both storylines? That they have taken the Mandalorian from a very stone-cold bounty hunter and now basically made him an adoptive father. That they've brought back a CGI Luke Skywalker again. That the first time it was a little bit of pandering to fans and as you said, we like seeing his powers. Now they brought him back again. They had Grogu reject him. They've brought back a very aged, a little bit puffy Boba Fett. Kind of messed up his universe where he's going through a midlife crisis, doesn't want to be a bounty hunter anymore. He's kind of now running this sleepy little desert town. And maybe he's going to do something else. They've introduced Bo-Katan who is now obviously a little bit power hungry. Could you say that they've kind of muddled up all these storylines and characters a little bit as well, despite the entertainment value? I'm going to go out on a limb and say no. 
only because I think there's more story to tell. And I think what we're seeing is, you know, like like a pebble being thrown into a pond, the first splash always seems a bit messy. But when you step back and you see the ripples going forward, it still com- smooths out and it works out. I think that's what's happening right now. Yeah. I think that they're introducing all these characters in one or two shows in a row to really set up what's going to happen going uh, forward. You know, whether it's season two of yeah. Book of Boba Fett, I don't think there's going to be a season two of Book of Boba Fett. I think they're going to merge the Book of Boba Fett, uh, sorry, the Book of Boba story with yeah. the Mandalorian story. There are. I believe there is also going to be a Bo-Katan series. Yeah, I've heard the same thing, that they're going to have so a spin So if for that's her. the case, yeah. which because I love her, I think she's great. Yeah. I think if that's the case, I think that her, depending on when it comes out, her series will either be about her trying to fight with, Bo- uh, uh, with Boba Fett or... Her battle with Boca Boba uh, will with Boba Fett will have been resolved, and she's either the leader of the Mandalorians or she's not. And if she's not, she's going off and doing her own adventures, which is fine. How many Mandalorians? But how many Mandalorians are there? I mean, we, we don't know exactly, but it seems we, like there's yeah, very no, few, right? Yeah. So theoretically, they're very, very few. And how do they reproduce? I mean, they can't take their helmets off. Uh, <laughs> So, so remember, so there are a couple different um, types of Mandalorians. Uh, yeah. And I think so there's there's the Mandalorians that we've known from the Mandalorian, right? Yeah. Which are the guys who wear the armor and who never take it off. Uh, and who are like, so Mandalorians are like a race. And then there's kind the, of like the warrior Mandalorians. There's a different set. That's okay. right. There are different factions. And so Bo, uh, Bo-Katan even mentions that, right? In mm. season two where she was like, ah, he's from that clan. That clan believes in the old way and the way they expanded their, uh, let's say their race was by adopting foundlings, mm. right? The, the, the whole point was that Din Djarin is a foundling and Grogu yeah. is now a foundling. Yeah. Is, yeah. Uh, by their creed, anyone who, any child that's in need and has lost their parents can kind of become yeah. adopted by them and becomes a Mandalorian. Yeah. Right? Mm. So that's my feeling. I like your theory, but I have to say, like I said, as, as much as I liked all those seasons, I really feel like one of the hallmarks of shows that can have a lot of longevity and really draw you in is that they can be a little bit ruthless in terms of moving on from characters. You know, as fans, we once you fall in love with a character or kind of storyline, you want it again and again. You know, Grogu is, is by all accounts super adorable there's no lack of you know cuteness you know that he can uh exhibit but again i thought that to kind of bring him back again was a little bit pandering and now he seems to be in it for the long haul the same thing with cgi luke i mean for me luke is a very sacred character i mean i already had some issues in terms of how he was portrayed in you know the film seven eight nine to bring him back in the CGI in Mandalorian season two, I was kind of like, I mean, we both love that action sequence, but I was kind of like, wow, this is really bringing back something in a CGI way. Okay. And now they had an extended, you know, scene with him and even showed Grogu kind of reject the force, which is a little bit taboo as well. I mean, they're really playing with a little bit of fire here. Again, we love the creator, we love the writers, we love the shows. It's, that's not the criticism. It's just saying the storylines are are really being uh, they're playing with fire in a way, right? Yeah, I think I think we're done seeing Luke. Yeah. That's my feeling. Is that we're yeah. done with Luke in the yeah. in all the TV shows now? Yeah, they've kind of um, uh, blown their load. If you want yeah. to use it that way, but how um, do you feel about but how do you feel about seeing him again in CGI? Like, uh, I thought the like... CGI in this was far better than it was. Yeah. It was a little sketchy at the yeah. end of season two of Mandalorian. It was yeah. far better here. Yeah. Uh, in terms of that, I, I was okay with it. I was okay with it. I didn't like the choice at the end of that episode where he's like, "You can either take go back to your father." Or yeah. you can take this, yeah. or you can take Yoda's lightsaber. Yeah. 
Yeah. I didn't like that because it was... This is where you always... I don't like uh, ultimatums, right? I don't, I like, don't ultimatums. like ultimatums. And the Jedi don't believe in ultimatums. But... The Sith do. But we're forgetting one thing. Do you remember Dagobah? The yeah. same thing happened where Yoda's like, hey, you've got to complete your training. And Luke's like, no, i got to go help my friends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. You're absolutely Luke, right. Luke, kind of the hypocrite, said, yeah, dude, I'm going to go see my friends. I'll just start training whenever I get back. I'll see you yeah. when I see you. And Yoda's like, it doesn't work that way. And Luke's like, well, it does. I'll be back. Luke, Luke took off, saved Leia and Solo, right? Comes back and says, okay, let's complete the training. I'm ready now. Yeah. I, I mean, think it's also, yeah. they also teed it up to say, there's because precedent. remember there's that one sequence where he says, it's more like he's remembering than he is yes. learning. Yes, correct. So I think that they teed it up to say that he's, Grogu's going to have force powers. Yeah. And if there's a question of why he's got force powers when he's not been trained, no, yeah. no, no. He's already been trained. He had space amnesia. He's back now. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's, that, look, there's a lot of ways around it. I don't think we're going to see Luke back. And like you, and I don't say this with any disrespect to Luke Skywalker, I loved him. I don't want to see him back. Yeah, I agree. You know, let his story, his story played out nicely yeah. in episodes four, five, and yeah. six. It played out not so nicely in seven, eight, nine. Yeah. Let's, you know, let's wash our hands and call it a day. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Do, do you think one of the hallmarks of this, uh, of Mandalorian and Boba is that they've got very, very good supporting characters? When you think of the original Star Wars, you know, four, five, six, you think of the main characters and that's it, right? Whereas here, I mean, of course, Fennec was great. Even some of the uh, the guards were great. Um, you know, there's, I felt like they had, even, even though some of the names kind of escaped me, you know, this mechanic, for example, who helped uh, Mandalorian put together this new Pelly, spacecraft, yeah. right? I mean, that's a very adjacent character but i felt like this show has very very good adjacent characters that made it so much more likable just because the main characters mandalorian and boba don't really speak a lot right they're they're strong and silent type of people yeah i think that's the advantage of tv over movies yeah you, know, you have you have 90 to 120 minutes to get through the story yeah. here you have seven hour-long episodes to get through yeah. the story you can afford to spend an extra episode on Fennec or an yeah. extra episode. Uh, by episode, I mean, you know, an extra 20 yeah. minutes, 30 minutes on those, yeah. uh, you know, say, let's say side characters or NPCs, you know? Yeah. And what do you think of the, the overall tone? I mean, there's the original Star Wars had, you know, like some moments of levity, right? I mean, yeah. mostly from Han Solo. I'd say those are probably the only like quips and one liners and things. Here, there's a little bit more occasional silliness, right? Yeah, yeah. I think this is ties up more with, with episodes one, two, and three, mm. which were also they had a little bit small, they had small bits of sight gags, visual gags, yeah. things like that. You yeah. get a little bit more of that in the TV series as well, and yeah. it's nice also because you can't you like these guys have done with the Marvel Cinematic Universe, you can't always have it high stakes and dark all the time. Mm. Otherwise, it becomes too heavy, right? You, it, whether it's a movie or a TV show, it just becomes too heavy if it's 90 minutes or 60 minutes or 45 minutes of, oh my God, the world is ending. Oh my God, this is happening. You know, you need a little bit of brev uh, levity. And I think the yeah. in that sense, I think they've done a good job, right? Yeah. Like, for example, you see the scene where the Mandalorian gets on, like, a commercial spaceship, right? I mean, we, yeah. we're, we're, we're so used to, you know, the... Every character having their own ships and then yeah. just the screen wipe and going to the Ex next thing. Exactly. Exactly right. This was a little bit more granular. And I think that's one of the nice things about the show, which is it shows a little bit more in terms of the day-to-day -day life, right? And it, and it yeah. has to have the balance as well. I mean, we're not really there to see, like how they go grocery shopping and, and pay their bills and things like this. But I mean, they, they did an interesting job of just kind of showing, you know, some of the practicalities of, of yeah. how folks some get of the around, more you know? mundane aspects of life. Right. Yeah. Which is fine, which is yeah. absolutely fine. Notice nobody has like communication devices. There's no like mobile phones or no one seems to like really call each other. It's all like, it was a long, long time ago. 
All of this did take place a very long time ago. Apparently. So what what are we looking at now going forward? So Mandalorian season three is confirmed, right? That's I'm, I don't think it is, but I'm, I mean, of course it is. Okay. And book of Boba, there's going to be a series, a second series. They haven't announced any sequels. So we're not sure what the brand is going to be, but we're almost confident that all the characters are going to be reunited somehow. Exactly. Exactly. I believe Bo-Katan is getting her own series. Mm -hmm. I am confident that season three of Mandalorian, if I, if it already has, if it hasn't already been confirmed, will be confirmed. confirmed. Yeah. Well, there you go. Book of Boba, I don't think has been confirmed, but I'm confident we are not done seeing all of those characters, whether they yeah. come up in their own series or whether they yeah. come up in uh, other people's series. And then we've got in May, Obi-Wan Kenobi's show comes out, but that's so, going to be based obviously before episodes, uh, episode four. So in terms of timeline, it'll have nothing to do with any of these characters. So we're not, so when Obi-Wan comes out, we're not yeah. sure if this, we, we're not sure where this timeline is going to be in. Whether it's going to kind of coincide with one, two, three in the films, or if it's even prior to one, two, and three, right? Yeah, I think it's going to be ep- between episode three and episode four. I think it's going to be pre Luke Skywalker, but it's going to be post Anakin's becomes Darth Vader. Okay, so after he's kind of like cut off Anakin's legs and left him to die by this lava pit, yeah, and then we see that you know, uh, Luke and Leia were given birth to. This is kind of going to be coincide with kind of like the childhood or upbringing of, of Luke and Leia, right? I believe. I believe. I don't okay. know. Of course, there's no been, there's not been any trailers and, you know, Disney's been very yeah. good about keeping that under wraps. Mm-hmm. And un- unless I missed something big, I be- for me, that makes the most sense. And it makes the most sense be- because I think it's going to be between... Let's put it this way. I think it's going to be between episode two and episode four. I think there will be some overlap. And I have a sneaking suspicion that we're going to see the return of Darth Maul Mm. uh, from episode one. So I believe that it it in terms of timeline, it makes sense that it would be between episodes two and four. So is is the lore or the way that it it was, we think it goes, is that after this big you know, fight scene that we see in episode three between Anakin and Obi-Wan, then basically they don't have any communication until episode four when... Who Obi-Wan, doesn't have any communication? Anakin or Darth Vader and yeah, Obi-Wan. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's kind of what we assume, right? Because then when we go back to, you know, the original Star Wars, right? A New Hope. You know, Darth Vader says something like, hey, I felt something that I haven't... I haven't felt in years. In, yeah. in a very long time, right? And, exactly. and the implication is that since that big battle, they've kind of like stayed in their own corners and nothing's really taken place. That's which right. also, that which, time... Yeah, which also kind of begs the question, which is if Darth Vader's been getting stronger and stronger in that 20-year interim period, like what's Obi-Wan been doing except like just getting old in a corner, right? Well, that's the that's what I think the show. That's what we'll find out. That's what I believe the show is going to do because that is one of the few of the Skywalker saga. That's one of the few corners and the yeah. few areas that we don't really know about. Hmm. Okay. So that's what I think it could be about Darth Maul because you know, again, in the cartoons and in the animated shows, we see that Darth Maul is very active during this time period. And it culminates, uh, actually, I'm going to save that spoiler because I don't think you know it. So I'm going to save that spoiler for you. Oh. Uh, and I think it culminates in that period between right. uh, uh, episode three and four. Okay. So we put away Book of Boba Fett. We hope to take it out again soon. And Obi-Wan, you said, is coming out in May. I, uh, yeah, I think May 25th. That's what I read last. I could be wrong, but I, I believe it's May we're going to see the Obi-Wan series. So Star Wars is going to be dormant for the next two to three months then, basically. Nothing new. No new content? It, or is there going to be any is. animated series in between now and then? So I'm not sure if there are. Bad Batch? I think it's, what about Bad Batch? So Bad Batch has already, I believe, finished oh. the first season. 
I, but don't, I mean, don't hold me to that. I saw the first, I think, five or six episodes, lost interest and moved on. Okay. Uh, so I, but I think it should be done by now if it isn't. Uh, and I think what they're going to do now is Disney's going to shift over from Star Wars to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And I think that uh, we're going to see uh, Moon Knight. So I think the Disney's focus is going to go from Star Wars to the Marvel Universe. Okay. We'll focus on that as well. Our focus exactly. is shifting as well. <laughs> Indeed. All right, Pete. It's been another good one with you. Likewise, Ethan. Uh, what do we have for our viewers coming up on our next episode? On the Should next we give episode. A teaser? Can we give a teaser? The moon is falling. <laughs> or crashing. <laughs> or crashing, as you'll come to see. All right. Moonfall, moon crash next episode. Join us then, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Editor's note here. Ethan, I think we forgot the most important part of our review on the book of Boba Fett, and that's to give it a score. We got so wrapped up in, in what was going to happen going forward with the plot that we forgot to... Uh, uh, to give our attention to how we scored it. So yeah, well, how, how do you look at it, Pete? What do you give it? So I really like the show, but I remember the idea was we look at the shows on a standalone basis, not as a we part do. of a universe. We do. And as it stands, if I were looking at Book of Boba Fett, I would say it is a solid mooch. A if mooch. you don't have yeah, if you don't have Disney Plus, go watch it with a friend who does. Borrow their password wherever you can. Uh, you should watch it that way. Well, lucky for you, Pete, I am going to give it a subscribe, and I do have <laughs> Disney Plus, so you are welcome to mooch it from me. But I think that I take all of your comments. Uh, and I agree with all of them, but I think that this is uh, not only well done, but it's also very important in the grand scheme of the Star Wars world. And I think that just in terms of the cultural importance and the water, water cooler talk, that it's important to subscribe. So I have it, and you're welcome to mooch it from me if you want, Pete. Perfect. That sounds awesome. Until next time. Thank you for listening to another episode of Films and Stuff. If you haven't already, please subscribe and review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever podcasts are downloaded. Films and Stuff. There is no substitute.